Thank you for joining us, Chris. Uh, let's start with uh, the uh, the very most important question that I wanted to ask. Yeah. How do you actually differentiate between branding and marketing? I think the lines between branding and marketing are blurring every single day because although there are different disciplines, the end goal is the same, which is to help create an experience for people. So a lot of people would define marketing as what you need to do to get a customer and branding is what you need to do to keep a customer. But then that starts to create divisions and silos and I don't like that. The person who creates the brand experience, what users come in touch with in terms of the packaging, the design, the customer experience, the, the voice, the messaging, that should also be taken into consideration with marketing because if marketing is purely driving sales but doesn't understand the culture and the relationship you have with a customer, it's gonna alienate the person. Like Apple's brand and marketing have to be in alignment. So for example, Apple holds the position that we're the market leader. We don't need to sell. We don't need to apologize. We don't need to talk about the features. We just talk about the feelings and we're an innovative company. But if all of a sudden marketing is begging us to buy their products, talking about the features, then it starts to feel misaligned. And I think that's why I think branding and marketing should share a lot more territory together so that it's a consistent experience for the end user. Would you say that one of them is much more linear than the another one? It's hard for me to say. It's like, I need to look at both maps. I don't have a clear enough picture to say like, okay, I can totally see the differences in terms of linear or not linear. Mm -hmm. Because what I was thinking is that maybe branding is uh, much more constant and maybe it change changes over the time. Uh, not with respect to more or so like what you want to do straight away, but you build on it. But marketing is something maybe it can be short term, maybe it can be long term. Yeah, and I think the relationship that we have with customers today requires marketing to not be static and linear. It needs to also adapt and change because of technology platforms and our customers change. So to use the same strategy over and over again, I think that's a pretty good recipe to slowly lose market share. Definitely, definitely. Uh, with the, uh, I think in a couple of decades or so, we've been trying to shift our marketing strategies and how we um, move from different platforms of uh, marketing resources and all. And uh, with, I think right after COVID, there has been a very big change in marketing strategies and the platforms we use specifically. And I've realized in uh, East and West, there is a very big difference. Uh, with the East specifically, if you say like a big, one of the biggest market is China, and then you have uh, Soviet based companies. Uh, when I say Soviet based companies, it's mostly Central Asian countries or countries which were part of Russian Federation. So those countries are more towards Telegram. And I've realized like uh, com uh, uh, countries which are more related to China, they are more focused with WeChat marketing strategies and online marketplaces, which are based on WeChat. Is there a, some sort of a correlation with the East and West when it comes to marketing strategies? Have you seen some differences or, uh, or similarities? I think the principles aren't different. I think the West, uh, having been industrialized and having economic wealth uh, for a pretty long time, has been just playing the game a little bit longer, where we see the rise of middle class and uber rich people in Asia, Russia, and China, and they're just learning the rules now. But what we do see are the different preferences for platforms and delivery of message, but the message isn't entirely different. The message is, I have a product or service that is gonna improve your life, create a transformation for you. And there's many creative ways in which I can do that. I would love to like zoom out and say, well, what are the bigger differences across geography, what are the differences that we all can point to? Well, number one, the customer controls the brand. Now, the, the company does not own the brand, the customer does, because our ability to speak to each other in mostly free open platforms allows us to have our own opinion about a product service or organization. And it used to be controlled by dominant media, television, paper, radio, that kind of thing. So now we are moving away from the company saying, this is what we believe towards helping influencers, people that we trust and like and, and respect, say that for us. This is what we like, therefore you will like it too. 
So it's become the rise of the personal brand as influencer marketing starts to take greater weight. I saw an article somewhere, can't remember, but there are influencer farms on a scale that I've never seen before in China because people do not trust corporate messaging. And so what they have are these, it seems like almost like a factory where people are in six foot by six foot cubicles creating content on TikTok and other platforms to grow their influence. And they have the resources to do that. It's both exploitive, but also creating opportunity for people who would have done. So poor villagers don't have to necessarily work on farms and industrial jobs where they put their lives on the line. They can actually develop the craft of developing a personality, being charismatic and building a social following, connecting with people. They're making, in some instances, ridiculous amounts of money. And I'm, I'm happy when people are successful that way. So we, we do see things changing like that, but the delivery vehicle, we shouldn't care so much about like whether it be on WeChat, Telegram, on Facebook or Instagram. It's just a platform. So do you think that uh, it has also something to do with the type of personalities people have in different areas? Like how you mentioned about um, the uh, just now the, the, the marketing strategies that people are going towards individual personality development and all that. And I was also reading an article today. I think there was... Uh, there was, there has been a record broken by one woman from China or Shanghai, I think. Uh, she made uh, 19 million in a day just through uh, the market uh, marketing products, and I think that was uh, it's a big thing. Like if you can make 19 million in a day, that, that that opens up a lot. But I think this has also something to do with. Uh, a regional status that a, a, a country has like for example Shanghai is a hub and everybody over there you know that they are going to uh, they are either trying to be a celebrity or they already are a celebrity and if you uh, see similar thing in Europe you will see like Paris in US you will see New York and places like this these are like the hubs but is it the same implementation that we can look at everywhere or maybe the future is this so other countries or maybe every country needs to have a market hub which is specific for this this kind of modeling i i'm not sure I, I, to make such a big broad statement like that but it does seem to be heading that direction because when a big corporation says we're the best and we're reliable and and it's we're worth it you, you kind of look at it with some skepticism but when you look at peer reviews like yelp like uh, like even Uber reviewing drivers and hotels and all that kind of stuff, we tend to respect and believe the opinions of thousands of people who are real people, not robots. And we're like, okay, well, the masses seem to think this is a good place or a good value. And so we become a much more informed society in what we want to buy. And then when we're entertained or someone gives us value, we feel a connection to them in an asymmetrical way. This is the crazy part of social media. The gatekeepers are gone. Anybody can be a star. Anyone can have a relationship with a lot of people simultaneously. So I broadcast so I broadcast content as you do. It reaches lots of people and they listen to it or watch it and they feel like they have a relationship with you, even though you've never met them before. This asymmetrical relationship, which is a fairly new phenomenon. It used to be a very controlled thing that corporations had their paws all over. But now you and I as a nobody in the world with a microphone, some technology and a little production, we can reach lots and lots of people. So rather than the corporations spending the money to buy the media to broadcast their messages, I think what they do is now they cut up that budget and they send it to influencers who are aligned with their values, who can speak about the products and have a highly engaged audience. That's much better money spent because then now we trust these people. And if they don't betray the trust of their audience and their community, this relationship works for everybody. It gives me another question. Do you think that this kind of model is sustainable in a long run when you look at the lifespan of influencers? Because these influencers, they gain popularity really fast. And to sustain that kind of uh, influence on your market, it's not easy. So do you think that this is sustainable? It depends on how they're their constitution as to how they're built and made up. If you're an overnight sensation, you don't even know why people like you and you don't have the mechanisms in place for supporting you. So emotionally, spiritually, 
all, all those kinds of things, you just don't have that kind of support. So you might crumble under the pressure. We've seen countless movies where there's a rags to riches story. And as soon as they get the riches, they're right back to rags again because they don't know how to spend money. They don't know how to manage their time. People, the vultures come flying in and they feed off your carcass. And before you know it, you've got nothing left. You got nothing left. And they're broke and broken. So I think for me, it is long-term sustainable if it's done the right way where you spend a couple of years developing your art and your craft. You figure out how to connect with your community. You start to sort out who you are and you build an organic growth that isn't skyrocketing, isn't a flash in the pan. It's not a trend of the moment. And I would caution companies to really take a longer look, not just the numbers, but the level of engagement and a little bit of history. Get to know who your influencers are, what they stand for and what they don't stand for such that when you align with them, your reputation as much as theirs is at stake and you don't want to risk it by aligning with the wrong types of people. Uh, let's look at another aspect of marketing now. Uh, freelancers and uh, startups are gaining a lot of popularity and a lot of countries are actually giving a lot of uh, development funds for startups and freelancers, uh, probably because of the financial situation globally and a lot of other political situations going on. How do you see people understanding marketing when it comes to startups? Because as a big business, yes, it's a very different ball game. You have to see branding and marketing very differently, and you have to uh, allocate uh, a large sum of funding for marketing for that specific purpose. When it comes to startups and freelancers, how do you see it? Well, for startups, these are two different things. Startups do do marketing. They just do guerrilla marketing. They don't have the same resources, so it forces them to be very creative. And I think that's a good thing. They have a lot of agility and an ability to move fast and break things and figure out how to do something to get people to like their thing. Now, I think the the record for fastest adoption of a new new platform is either on ChatGPT or maybe Threads or something like that. So we can see that as as people start new companies that the the appetite for new innovative ideas never goes away. Actually, we get hungrier for it. So if you have a standout product and you you seed it properly and you get it in front of the right people, it should take care of itself. I think a lot of times people build an inferior product that's not innovative, so they have to dump a lot of money to to capturing market share or mind share. And that's something that startups cannot afford to do. So they only exist because they have a new novel idea or way of doing something that could revolutionize a particular sector or vertical. So in that case, if you do something that's worth talking about to be remarkable, the marketing takes care of itself. That's good. Um, another thing that I've realized in the market at the moment is subscription based marketing models, which are becoming really popular, especially if you go to uh, the freelancers.com and a few other freelancing websites, a lot of people are giving subscription based marketing, which are mostly relying on short term plans. And I feel like it's uh, more of a tool to give them a taste of their services. And at the same time, creating some sort of, um, you can say like a bond building type of uh, uh, programs where you can actually come into the program and then see how you can grow further. Do you think that this is a, a very sustainable and a very uh, creative way of uh, doing freelancing and business? People who are much smarter than me, people who are accountants and economists, say that the subscription service industry is destined to become that. It, it will be the dominant form at some point. It takes a while to get there, obviously, because it's such a radically different idea. And for your audience, I want to clarify my understanding of retainer versus subscriptions, okay? A retainer is you pre-selling blocks of time and you're compensated based on how much of that time you use. So for example, if I sell you a, a block of time at a discount, which is the point of retainer, if you don't use those 12 hours, the, the hours roll over mm -hmm. up into a certain period of time. And that depends on the terms and conditions. So retainer is different than subscription, where a subscription, you pay for the money, uh, you pay the money for the service or the product, regardless if you use it or not, and you're happy to do so. And, then it's incumbent upon the service provider, a creative person, 
to constantly think about the relationship and how they can continue to add value such that you never feel like you want to cancel the subscription. Let's take a business model we all can understand. Let's say you're you're paying for Netflix and I don't know what it is, like say it's $30 a month for a plan. If Netflix doesn't release new content or do something innovative, you eventually say, well, I'm done. I'm going to cancel my subscription. I'm going to do something else. So they have to constantly pay for original programming, concerts, movies, comedies, whatever it is that they pay for, such that you're like, you know what? It's worth the 30 bucks. It doesn't matter to me. If you take that same concept, you scale it up to three, ten, or thirty thousand dollars, a service provider, a designer, a creative person, a marketer can say, look, look, we're gonna enter into an engagement. The the shortest subscription time is this amount of time, and it can go on forever. Or if you outgrow us, we can sell you a different plan but I'm going to now obsess over your business and figure out how to market it over time. And you know, if we're doing a great job, we'll have more marketing services to do because your, your, your company's growing. You know, if things aren't working, we still have more work to do because we have to fix the things that aren't working. We're trying out different concepts. I think it changes the dynamic, the relationship such that I obsess over your business and the results that you want. And you continue to feel that you get greater value than what you pay. So we both sleep well at night. What is the biggest mistake uh, startups are making and the big businesses are making in marketing right now? I don't know enough to answer that question, unfortunately. In your experience, have you seen um, or experienced some big corporations or startups which are making consistently similar mistakes? As a broad answer, the only thing I can think of right now is to say that uh, let's take a page from Nike's playbook here. And there was... Um, a, a movie with Matt Damon in it recently about the origins of Jordan and how he was signed with Nike, right? So they had this very risky strategy to, instead of sponsoring 10 athletes, they sponsored one athlete with a budget of 10 because they knew this person was a prospect and could change the game. They bet and it was a big gamble and they won and it cha they changed the game forever. And I think the mistake is to hedge your bets against so many different options that you get really no market penetration, no real value created. And so I would say maybe consolidate your bets. Maybe it's not one bet, but three bets and say, look, you have a finite budget, figure out, do some, some research and, 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 and make an educated decision and gamble a little bit so that you can get the most value. So it's just about the law of focus, like put your money together and drive one idea or a couple ideas adjust as you go, but don't spread it across a hundred different things because I'm not sure it's going to work. This gives me another question. A lot of marketing um, companies, when they're trying to create a narrative of their marketing strategy, uh, at the moment, because of the situations going on, either they are forced or uh, indirectly or directly uh, depends on the, on the company, but they are um inclined to choose a political you can say narrative how how do you see companies right now handling this kind of situation right now i think if it's intrinsic within the founder and the executive team and their beliefs and value are aligned with a polit specific political point of view then you should go for it because it'll be genuine and authentic but if you're trying to catch certain parts of the conversation and demographic and it's a marketing ploy, it will blow up in your face. I believe something like this happened to Bud Light when they hired a trans person to represent them and they didn't think this through and they're really not that kind of progressive company and their audience is definitely not progressive at all. And so that decision cost them, I think, according to some estimates, billions of dollars because people turned on them. Yeah. Let's, let's flip the equation. When Nike decided to back Colin Kaepernick because he wanted to take a knee because of what was happening, the injustice in American racism as a, as a form of silent protest, and he was casted out of the NFL, they chose to stand with him. And it was a risky decision, but it's kind of in alignment with how Nike behaves. They're the rebels. They stand for progressive ideas. And so as many people that burn the shoes that they own, more people bought them than burned them. So they're doing just fine. So I think you really have to dig deep into who you are, the kind of perspective you have in the world and why it matters to you and not just looking for opportunities to, to catch some kind of moment in, in, in life. 
I think the similar situation is uh, the market share that you have in the brand as well. Something like Apple, like whatever they do, people are still going to buy their products. And if you realize like a new uh, product, uh, Prime, has a similar sort of situation. They have been going through a lot of controversies, but people are still flooding to buy their products. And it's a new product. Prime is like, it's not, it wasn't a brand until Logan made it a brand. So that's something that, 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 that is quite interesting for me because Apple, it's, it's established brand, but Prime itself is a very new brand. That's right. That's an example of influencer marketing at its highest level. Basically that's colored water with some components to it that may or may not have any real physical benefits to it. Logan Paul and KSI, two of the biggest YouTube influencers, get together to bury their own rivalries and do something to launch across uh, two continents, basically, or two two countries, right? And I I think given their their engagement, their ability to promote, they're able to launch that thing from zero to whatever it's doing right now, which is going to make everybody involved a lot of money. And even in its controversies, whether it actually has benefits or the, the shenanigans that either character will get into, it seems like in this modern age that unless you royal, royally F it up, you're still going to be able to capture market share. And it's upsetting the entire business ecosystem. The paradigm has shifted such that the established players need to wake up and say, well, how are we doing? We've been sponsoring established athletes, but they don't really have a dialogue with their fans the way these influencers do. How do you see market, uh, I mean, global marketing change in the next five to 10 years? Okay. I know it's the same question, but I actually had to think about what the answer might be. So here's what I think. I think with artificial intelligence, we're able to give a way more customized experience for people. And we can now create a message or a tool or an activation that is built for individuals, not even groups of people anymore. So the, the old way to market is we're going to broadcast one message across all platforms. As, as it's evolved, they're like, well, let's do something different for each city. So it's still groups of people, but it's more localized. I think the new form of marketing will take into consideration many variables about you as a human being, what you like and dislike, and be able to craft an image, a video, a message that's tailored for you with some AI training. I think that's the era that we're living in. And that I don't think is five years. I think that's not even a year away. So you and I would not see the same ad just because we're two different types of people from the same company. That's interesting. Thank you so much, Chris. Have a nice day. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.